Renaissance fan novels when I was going through his uh, dossier. I was like, wow. Okay, film and television directing collaborations and seminal works such as The Executioner's Song with Norman Mail or Articles in the New Yorker, the list goes on. Schiller began his career as a photojournalist working for such periodicals as the Paris Match, Life, and the Saturday Evening Post, taking photos of such iconic figures as Muhammad Ali, Clint Eastwood, and Marilyn Monroe. This evening, we will talk about the time he spent with Mar Marilyn, photographing her just months before her death, um, which he documented in his new book, Marilyn and Me, which we're selling over there. And there is also a very beautiful version by Toshin, which you can all look at and purchase with these uh, photographs in a large format. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Schiller. Thank you. I see some uh, new faces, and I see those people that uh, have known me for a few few years. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, uh, over many, many years, I developed a, a relationship with a very, very fine and skilled writer, a man who was maybe in some ways ahead of his time, Norman Mailer. And uh, uh, Norman and I worked together uh, in different ways. We fought with each other and we screamed at each other. We even once whisked each other down the stairs and against the bellows. But sadly, when he passed in uh, 2007, uh, we uh, uh, came up with the idea of taking his home in Provincetown and turning it into a writer's colony. And with Norris Mailer, his wife, who's since his passed, uh, other members of the family, uh, some of them are here tonight, Barbara Wasserman, his sister, and John Buffalo, and his youngest son, and Peter, his nephew. Uh, we uh, we uh, are attempting to do something quite different there. Now, I started at a very, very young age, believe it or not, being unable to read or write. I couldn't read at all through uh, grammar school, most of high school, and I had a very difficult time writing. It wasn't until uh, Norman Mailer, at eight, when I was 56 years old, figured out that I was dyslexic. Of course, in the 40s, when I grew up and went to school, uh, the word dyslexia, I don't even think, existed in the medical dictionaries. Uh, so my association with uh, writers came out of my insecurity, because I had all these things I wanted to express myself, all these ideas, all these people I was meeting, so I would ask writers to write on subjects that interested me, and some of them stepped up to the plate and uh, stepped into the ring with me. It started with Albert Goldman with a wonderful book, Ladies and Gentlemen, Lenny Bruce, and went on with Norman Mailer, Wilfred Sheed, and other writers. Uh, and I'm very, very proud that over the years, by osmosis, I learned. I learned that the word there uh, could be spelled two different ways. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, still sometimes with my dyslexia I get it mixed up and I type it one way though my mind is thinking a different way. But it was a great experience in life. I became a film director uh, and uh, uh, met some really great writers, uh, playwrights. Uh, Robert Anderson who wrote Tea and Sympathy, Never Sank for My Father, taught me a lot, uh, as did a woman. And in Belarus in 1993, Norman and I were doing a book called uh, Oswald's Tale. And uh, I had made this comment to the head of the KGB uh, that uh, Norman was going to spend a year of his life in Minsk researching Lee Harvey Oswald, and that they had an obligation to contribute the KGB files on Lee Harvey Oswald. And then I turned, and in my cockiness, as you'll read some of my young copies, or I'll read it to you tonight. I said, you know, Mr. Mailer was sitting there with a heart condition. I didn't realize that a few years later I'd have a heart condition. Uh, you know, gives each book five, six years of his life. And maybe he's got three years, three books left in his life. And if he's willing to give one of them to you, you know, you, you should really contribute. Well, we did come to terms with the KGB. But in fact, that night, Norman really got mad at me and he says, you know, I'm not writing any more books with you. It's over. You're going to have to learn how to write. 
And then he walked away, he cracked the joke, and he said, 5,000 words on a thesaurus. That's all you need, you know. You've got enough chutzpah in you to do the rest. <laughs> so I did start uh, to write. I started to learn to write. And I write in a very, very unusual way. Uh, I can't write from my head. I can't take a blank sheet of paper and write things. Uh, but what I do is I have somebody interview me. It can be a close friend like Larry Grobel. It could even be Norman Mailer who did once on an airplane for three and a half hours. And we take the interviews. And then I take the interviews and I have them all transcribed. And then uh, I even have somebody else read them and say, underline in yellow pen, oh, this is great, this is bullshit. You know, this, you know where's the, the facts behind this? Uh, and then I go through and I kind of just organize it. And I get up at 2 o'clock in the morning with my own words in front of me, and I write until sunrise. Uh, and then Norman, you know, who was, I guess, my mentor for this part of my life, introduced me to some very fine editors. Uh, one of them is Veronica Wimholtz, who worked with Norman at Random House. And then he introduced me to a young lady, short hair, blonde, and once in a while I let her read it, Barbara Wasserman, Norman's sister. And she's really a critic. She doesn't like to admit it, but she helped Norman a lot when he was starting to write. Uh, a very, very fine editor uh, in her own way. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I started as a photojournalist at age 16, photographing skid marks from automobile accidents and selling the pictures to insurance companies. The skid marks told a story. They said, you can tell a story of an accident in words, but you can also tell it in pictures by just looking at the skid marks. But as a photojournalist, I started to meet a lot of people. And in the beginning, I didn't take any notes. I didn't do any tape recordings. I didn't preserve what I did. Uh, starting in 1963, I did. I did my first interviews on tape. Uh, but in 60 and 62, when I was uh, a photojournalist climbing the ladder, uh, I did not take notes and so forth. But I used to go and brag to everybody. I'd go run home and tell my wife what was happening, or tell a friend, oh, you won't believe it. She said this, that. So when I sat down to write my autobiography, which is being written, and we've been published since 2015, I had to go back and even, I had to go visit my ex-wives and say, now will you help me out? <laughs> and it was really kind of fun. And I went back and, and spoke to a lot of people. And I said, well, you know, I remember this. And then, of course, I had all my photographs which triggered my mind. And I had to separate what was legend and what was fact. And sometimes, you know, when you get to be 75 as I am, it's a little difficult because as John Houston once said to me, you know, you can always dramatize a story as you get older, it looks a little bit better and better, and you can add something. But as I write in the introduction of Marilyn and Me, which is a chapter of my autobiography, it's 27,000 words, which I pulled out of the autobiography to publish this year. Uh, I explain how I was interviewed and how I went back and spoke to people that were still alive and it helped trigger my memory. So being somebody that couldn't read, now I'm going to read my own words. So if I stumble or if I mix up sentences, you'll know that I really am dyslexic. You know? It's not part of the performance of this evening. Uh, I've, I've just gone through this and pulled out like six or seven different little sections. Hopefully it won't be more than about 12 minutes, 15 minutes. And then we can do a Q&A and you can challenge me on what I've read or said. And we can have some fun, you know. That's what it's all about. Don't do anything serious. It should all be fun, I have to tell you. So I remember when I pulled into the parking lot, and by the way, some of these sentences I may not read word for word. I may just like jump around because it's, they're so real to me, you know. I had the experience and so sometimes you know, the fact that it was put in perfect grammar doesn't really fit Larry Schiller, but the short and long of this, we'll try it, okay? When I pulled into the uh, parking lot at 20th Century Fox Studios uh, in the station wagon in April of 1960, I kept on telling myself that this was just another assignment. She was just going to be another pretty girl. I was going to photograph. But in fact, it wasn't just another assignment, and in fact, she wasn't just a, another pretty girl. In 1956, when I was a college photographer, I'd seen this angelic face on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, after that, I began to make my way into photojournalism. 
I got assignments, yes, to photograph Jimmy Stewart and Lee Remick and Anatomy of Murder and the dancer Julie Newmar on the Broadway and motion picture Little Abner. But it never occurred to me that I, a guy who was out shooting hard news, doing stories, would ever have a chance to photograph what was every man and every woman's fantasy, the star of lots of movies, an icon in her own way, Marilyn Monroe. You see, Look Magazine had hired me. I was just one of five photographers. They wanted to photograph Monroe in a movie called Let's Make Love. The studio published publicist, Johnny Cook, took me to one of the many sound stages. You know, I already knew what the large trucks containing the recording equipment looked like. I understood what the flashing light in front of the entrance was, indicating that filming was in progress. We waited a few seconds, the light went off. The publicist went, led the way through the heavy soundproof doors. Inside, the large arc lights and dolly tracks were being moved one side of the stage to another. Walking past this hub of activity, we arrived at a dressing room at the back of the sound stage. I had to admit that I was excited, but I tried real hard not to show it. The publicist said we had to wait right there. Somewhere in the distance, I can tell you, I heard the sound of music and I heard even somebody singing. Uh, the singing wasn't as good as the music. Then suddenly, the music stopped, and really out of nowhere, Marilyn Monroe appeared. There she was wearing a black leotard, sheer stock black stockings, and her face was as soft as a silk bed sheet, but her expression was she was unapproachable. She passed me by as if I didn't even exist. I stood there, and she just walked up the steps of her dressing room. The publicist, a little smarter than I, said, oh, this is Larry. He's with Look Magazine, and he'll be around for a few days. Well, Marilyn stopped, turned around, looked at me with a big smile, and took two steps down. It wasn't because of Larry Schiller, it was because of Look Magazine. Hi, I'm Marilyn, she said, putting her hand out. I didn't know what to say, and I don't know where it came from, but I said, oh, I'm the big bad wolf. I had no idea why I said it, and it even made me more nervous than I was. I stuck my hand out after the, the end of the sentence with my three cameras dangling around my neck. Marilyn giggled, and then she broke out with a laughter. You look a little bit young to be so bad. Well, I'm 23, I said. I've been shooting pictures since I was 15. I managed to answer. You know, I had to tell her everything I knew about myself as a photographer to prop myself up. You know, look, I was a good photographer. 23, she looked at me and said, well, let's see, I made Asphalt Jungle in that year. And then I made this picture and that picture. She went on and on. Then Marilyn walked up the two steps, leaned against the green door of her dressing room. Come on in, Mr. Wolf, she said in that very soft voice. In fact, Marilyn was really brilliant when it came to photography. Oh, maybe I skipped to the wrong page. Yep, I went to the wrong place. Taking one of the cameras around my neck, I followed behind her as she went up the steps. Once I was at the door, I did what I was supposed to do. I, she sat down in front of the mirror, and I started shooting. I had gotten off only a few shots when a short woman appeared and started combing her hair. Marilyn, who, by the way, had final photo approval of all my images, caught my eye in the mirror and, without turning around, said, that's not the best angle for me. Now, if you go over there, tilting your head slightly to the left, you'll get a better photo, because that's where the light is. I moved to where she suggested, and at that moment she turned her head halfway in my direction, looking over her left shoulder. She flashed a coy smile and told me all that I needed to know about Marilyn Monroe. She knew who she was, she knew who I was, she knew what to do, and she may have understood light and photography better than I did at age 23. I changed my cameras, lifted the Nikon with the 105 lens. Marilyn smiled a second time, and I pressed the shutter. Immediately, I had the shot. Now, I wound up being with her for three or four days, and it's all kind of very, very interesting, but I'm going to kind of jump ahead, uh, because what really happens in the future, in some ways, is more interesting. I photographed her for a couple of days. She approved mostly all the pictures. 
And for two years, I did not see Marilyn Monroe. I went on to becoming photographer of the year, taking a lot of iconic images. Uh, we had a, a daughter, and then we were expecting a second child. In those same two years, Let's Make Love, the film that I met her on, died at the box office. The press reported that Marilyn had suffered a third miscarriage, and her next picture, The Misfits, with the dream cast of Clark Gable, Monty Cliff, and Eli Wallach, fell apart when John Huston, who was directing it, was at a loss on what to do with Marilyn. Her eyes didn't focus. She eventually had to return to Los Angeles for a hospital rest. Filming in Nevada was shot, uh, shut down. Shortly after the movie was finished, Gable died, and everybody started blaming Marilyn for his death. They said she had kept him waiting for too many hours in the boiling hot sunlight. Marilyn's six-month affair followed with Frank Sinatra. She didn't, that didn't seem to solve any of her emotional problems. Against her will, she spent three days in a locked and padded room in Payne Whitney, a psychiatric clinic in New York, clinic in New York. After being rescued there by Joe DiMaggio, she had Gladstone surgery. At the same time, she suffered from uh, deliberate, deliberating insomnia. Back in California, she fell under the spell of a new psychiatrist, her 17th, Dr. Ralph Greenson, who saw her five times a week. She also brought a house for the first time any physical possession. It was in Brentwood between Beverly Hills and the Palisades. She trimmed down 28 pounds to make Something's Gotta Give for 20th Century Fox, which she was under contract to. Now I come back into the story with Marilyn. In May of 1962, Perry Match assigned me to photograph Marilyn in Something's Gotta Give, in which she would co-star with Dean Martin and Wally Cox. After Marilyn approved me, I asked Perry Lieber, the studio's publicist, for a copy of the script so I could get some idea of the story and the scenes that would work best photographically. By then, you have to understand that I had learned a lot more about business. I understood the power of publicity and that Life Magazine in the United States and Perry Match Abroad were so important to the motion picture studios. I had become a much better businessman by then, maybe a little too tough. I understood the value of exclusivity and I was tough and I was hard to get along with. I knew that when I called Pat Newcomb, Maryland's personal press representative, whom I had not met in 1960, I'd have a up uphill battle. Pat suggested that we meet at Maryland's house to discuss the shooting schedule. I didn't understand, I gotta tell you, what there was to discuss. Maryland swims, I shoot during rehearsals or the camera setups, she gets out of the pool, she talks to Dean Martin, she laughs with Willie Cox, Wally Cox, and I cover some other scenes to flesh out my coverage. Well, Pat said there had to be a meeting. When I arrived at Marilyn's home, I found this one-story, Spanish-style house almost bare. The house was wrapped around a nice-sized pool in the back, and there was a guest house. There was no art on the wall, just a few pieces of furniture and loose tiles were scattered all over the living room and kitchen floors. Later I would learn that her bedroom contained only a mattress and two small tables. This was, there was nothing on the walls in there either. Marilyn was wearing a checkered capri pants, a white blouse, and very little makeup. Almost ordinary, almost ordinary looking. Pat Newcomb was there, partially silhouetted against the, wind, uh, against the window a lean, athletic look about her. Marilyn was preoccupied with the tiles that were on the floor, but jumped into conversation with me. Larry, can I borrow your one good eye? That refers back to the fact of a section I didn't read in which she and I talk about the fact that I had a childhood accident and that I only have a good right eye and I'm blind in my left eye. Pat looked puzzled by the remark, but I thought it was funny. What do you do with these, Marilyn asked, pointing to a couple of tiles. I'm redoing the kitchen. I'm picking them out myself. Hi, I said to her and looked down at the tiles. Nice to see you again. You too, Larry. When Marilyn said something like, then Marilyn said something like, you got any batter since I last saw you? 
And then I looked up at her and said, quite a bit, I said. I was pleased that she had remembered our joking, but I knew this wasn't the time to talk about myself. In the living room, a few minutes later, Marilyn got down to business. I don't think there should be a lot of photographers shooting me on this movie, she said in a kind of a breathless voice, like the studio did on Misfits, too many. Then Pat continued on behalf of Marilyn. I'm sure you and Perry Match, meaning the magazine I was working for, can supply all the other foreign magazines with pictures. I then chirped in and said, I've seen Elliot Irwood's pictures from the Misfits. I didn't know what else to say. Elliot's sweet, Marilyn replied. And then she changed the subject. I'd like you to shoot me with Wally, Marilyn said, referring to Wally Cox. He's very funny. Then I looked at her. Well, what I'd really like to do to shoot you, wait. Let me guess, she interrupted. Splish, splash? The pool sequence is sure to be published everywhere, I said. It's just like Sam Shaw's photo of you from the Seven Year Itch, referring to the famous image of her with the white dress flying up and her underwear showing. She thought for a while and then continued. I've been thinking about this scene, Larry. I'm going to have a bathing suit on, nude colored when I jump in. But I'm thinking about coming out of the swimming pool without anything on. Interrupting, Pat looked at her and said, you're joking, aren't you? Not really, Marilyn replied. Then she went and continued. Larry, she said, looking intently and tough at me, if I do come out of that pool with nothing on, I want you to guarantee that when your pictures are published on the covers of the magazines, Elizabeth Taylor is nowhere in that issue. You really think of doing that, Pat asked again. Not really sure, Marilyn replied, but it's going around in my head. You see, Marilyn was getting paid $100,000 to do something she's got to give. Liz Taylor was being paid by the same studio a million dollars for Cleopatra. It was something that gnawed at Marilyn Monroe. Well, Marilyn, I said standing up, you're already famous. Now you're going to make me famous. You see, I was cocky. She looked at me, don't be so cocky, Larry. That line wiped the smile off of my face. And then she continued, just remember, photographers like you can always be replaced. I looked over at Pat, who was now smiling herself. Larry, Pat said, I'll help you out to the door, but don't forget, Marilyn has approval of all of your photos. Well, I won't read you the 17 or 18 pages of what took place a week later. But I'll, I'll show you some of the images before we go back. Marilyn did jump into the swimming pool with a bathing suit on. And this is one of my contact sheets taken with a Nikon camera and a motorized version of that, which allows the photographer to take multiple images very, very quickly. Here's one frame of, of a roll of film. But when you come in on the image, you wind up with an extraordinary image of Marilyn Monroe. This picture was taken not while they were filming, but in between the scenes when they were moving the motion picture cameras. Marilyn knew what to do. She understood light. She understood composition in a very unique way. Take the other camera from around my tech, a roll of color film, a little longer lens, and you've got this type of an image of Marilyn Monroe. A few minutes later, she comes out of the swimming pool, and of course, four hours I'm condensing into, what, a minute? And she delivers what she said she would. She came out with nothing on. Three, four weeks later, this, she doesn't show up for work. She's late. She runs to sing happy birthday to the President of the United States against the studio's orders. They threaten to fire her. And on June 1st, and of course I'm telegraphing this story very, very quickly, it becomes her 36th birthday. And there's a little birthday party for her on the set. 
Sadly, nobody shows up for the birthday party, and there was none that evening because she went to Dodger Stadium. Uh, sadly, she didn't have a birthday party that night. This is one of the pictures from that sequence. And my daughter, when she was like nine or 10 years old, maybe a little older, finally saw this picture one day in my office. And she said, Daddy, that's a picture that says everything but shows nothing. And, you know, truly, that was one of the pictures that Marilyn loved. Let me go on and read you a couple of things a little interesting. As, as you know, I pointed out before that Marilyn had the right to edit the pictures, all of my pictures. So I'm going to read you a little section about how Marilyn Monroe edited my photographs. She answered the, by the way, I've driven out to her house, the context of it. She answered the door, here you go, let's exchange, I said, handing her an oversized envelope with black and white proofs. I gave her the one that I was holding with the strip of color. Still standing in the doorway, she pulled out one of the strips, held it up, and then put it back in the envelope with the others. Let's go get Dom, she said to me. Who is Dom, I wondered. All I could think of was that I was now going to have to go deal with somebody else and that this was a new wrinkle that I hadn't anticipated. Instead of asking me inside to meet Dom, she grabbed a cardigan and headed for her car. I think it was a T-bird, but I don't really recall for sure. Marilyn mentioned, motioned me in and drove us up to Sunset Boulevard. We headed east on the strip near Schwab's drugstore where Lana Turner was said to have been discovered sipping ice cream and a soda at the counter. Marilyn parked the car under a street light and told me to wait. She'd be back in a few minutes. About eight to 10 minutes later, she came out of Schwab's holding a brown paper bag. Back in the car, instead of starting the engine, she reached into the bag and pulled out Dom, a bottle of Dom Perignon. She popped the cork like a wine steward, took a drink right out of the bottle, and said, pictures, please. I was upset. It was not the time or place sitting in the car under a street lamp to edit photographs. Let's now look at them, I protest. Let's not look at them, I protested. But Marilyn just took another swig, handed me the bottle, and said, I want to see them. Reluctantly, I reached into the envelope in my lap, pulled out the film strips. At the same time, she reached into her purse and took out an Eastman Kodak loop, a very, very fine magnifying glass. Then she took out what looked like a pair of scissors. She held one of the strips up against the street light and zip, she snapped the image right in half. Then she took the bottle from me, knocked it back again, took another look at the strip and went zip again. You see, these were not ordinary shears. These were what was known as pinking shears. They had this little zigzag to them. They're used when you hem dresses. Larry, you're not drinking, she said. No, I'm not. I'm just scared that I may wind up with no pictures, I said. With nothing more intelligent, I blurted out again, what kind of shears are those? They're pinking shears, she said. You know, being 25 years old, I said, what are pinking shears? You don't know anything about women's dresses yet, do you? You will very, very soon. Then I decided to take a drink, but it didn't go down smoothly, not while she was taking her pinking shears in her hand. It was almost dark. I could hardly see the pictures. I have no idea how she was getting through the strips. I'm going to jump ahead uh, in a little section here, one second. All right. I was at a loss what to say. I just blurted out the first thing again that came to my mind. You know, Yusuf Kosh once said to Anna Magnani when he showed her his proof sheets from the ones that he had shot, 
He apologized for all the wrinkles in her face that the lighting had produced and said he'd retouch the photographs. You know what Anna Magnani said? She said, don't you dare take them out. I've worked too hard for those wrinkles. That caught Marilyn's attention. She looked at me for a couple seconds and then said, maybe if I had those types of wrinkles, Fox would take me a lot more seriously. She does have an ordinary, extraordinary face, I said. I was hoping to divert her attention away from the pinking shears. I met her once when I was getting some award for the Prince and the Showgirl, she said. Anna hugged me for the camera and then called me some name like Punta. I don't know what it meant at that time. She looked up at the pictures again, repeated the word Punta in Italian, and went zip, zip, zip. By the time Marilyn was through with her editing, she had cut 70 of approximately 108 images in half. 70 sounds like a lot, but 38 approved pictures was better and good enough for me. The next day, would you believe it or not, I would throw away all the cut up images, oblivious to the historical value of them. I was living in the present and not the future. Who would know that Photoshop was soon to appear on the horizon? I'll go to now the last time I ever saw Marilyn. I'm not that good a reader, as you can tell, so I'm trying to get through this. On Saturday morning, August 4th, at around 9 a.m., I drove to Brentwood. You see, I'd received a phone call from Pat Newcomb saying that Marilyn was not going to do the Playboy magazine shoot she had originally indicated she would. Marilyn was in the front yard dressed in a simple, light-colored outfit. She was on her knees, I think, doing something with the flowers. As I got out of the car, she stood up and looked as if she'd been expecting somebody else. Her hair was uncombed and loose. Her face was without makeup. You'd never know it was Marilyn Monroe. She didn't look like any of the pictures that I had taken of her or any that I had seen taken by any other photographer. I didn't know you were going to come by, she said. She wasn't very friendly, and she seemed impatient. I just dropped by to drop these pictures off, I said, handing her an envelope with a couple more prints. I was talking to Judy about taking the baby to Palm Springs for the weekend, so I thought I'd stop by. I wanted to hear directly from you that you decided not to do Playboy. Pat wasn't authorized to make that call, she said, referring to Pat Newcomb. And I saw that she was getting more and more upset. It was the first time that I think I ever felt anger really coming from Marilyn Monroe. Should I discuss this with Pat on Monday, I asked. And then all of a sudden she turned. It's all about nudity. It's all, is that all I'm good for? I don't think she was looking for an answer. I'd like to show that I can do publicity without using my ass or getting fired from a picture, she blurted out again. I haven't made up my mind about Playboy. Let's leave it at that and I'll call you. Her expression said, leave me alone. Without a word, I handed her the envelope I'll look at them, she said, and I knew I'd gone too far, I'd pushed too hard, and I said to myself, I gotta get the hell out of here. And that was the last time I saw Marilyn. I was assigned to cover her funeral, and I made the very iconic picture of Joe DiMaggio and his son walking towards the crypt, which was published in magazines all over the world. Sadly, in a couple days, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Marilyn's death. If she was alive today and 86 years old, Charlie Rose yesterday asked me, what did I think she'd be doing? Well, she wanted recognition. She wanted to be acknowledged as an actress. And her years were certainly moving up on her very, very quickly. What would she be doing today, I said? I think she might be teaching acting at the actor's studio at 86. She was somebody that liked to give back 
and she was somebody that shared what she had with other people. She certainly shared herself with me and helped me on my road uh, to other successes in life. Thank you for putting up with my uh, erratic reading and I'm open to questions. Somebody has to be the first. Yes, sir. Well, it's very, very interesting because the question's been asked before. In 1962, I started doing tape recording interviews. The first person I ever interviewed was Margaret Oswald at the John F. Kennedy assassination in her home, the mother of Lee Harvey Oswald. And I started to understand the value of preserving history. But I also started to understand the value of, in essence, uh, an education, which I didn't really have a good education. So interviewing people was my education. In 1972, on the 10th anniversary of Marilyn's death, I decided to ask uh, the writer Norman Mailer, who I spoke about before, to write a 15,000 word introduction to a book of photographs. He replied with 95,000 words a biography. That started me thinking a lot about Marilyn. And at that time, I had a, a, a friend who started to interview me about events in my life from 63 to 72, 73. And a lot of those interviews were about Marilyn. Yes, they were five, six years later, but I talked a lot about my relationship with Betty Davis, a lot of other celebrities. So in 73, there's a record of a lot of the conversations. My daughter, who was 11 years old, who overheard a lot of conversations, years later was interviewed by Larry Grobel of Playboy magazine. My first wife, Judy, who I would go home every night to, uh, I would tell all the stories of what happened. She said this, that. Judy, surprisingly, has a very good memory and I think did make notes because she was an editor uh, with Ingenue Magazine. So in 2007, when I decided to start thinking seriously about my autobiography, which is not about celebrities, uh, it's, it's really about how one reinvents themselves in one's lifetime. Uh, Larry Grobel interviewed me twice a week, four hours a day, for a year and a half. There are 37,000 pages of transcripts of my entire life. At the same time, in 2007, I hired him to do all this. He went out and started interviewing as many people as he could. And Marilyn obviously came up on the subject. There were a lot of people still alive at that time, other photographers. Then what happened was, when I went looking now for the photographs, half my pictures in 2007 and 2008 were, had disappeared. Some were sold to Playboy, but the bulk of them were gone. And all of a sudden, I was having an exhibit in Beijing, China of my photography. And I needed my pictures of Richard Nixon back. Look Magazine had donated them to the Library of Congress. Uh, we had objected to the donation because they were my copyright, but photographers didn't have lawyers to fight the battles. But now I needed Nixon's pictures for China because Nixon is a god in China. So I went to the ambassador in Beijing and I said, can you write to somebody at the Library of Congress to see if you can get my pictures back from Nixon? And I told them the story that they had like 90 assignments of mine. And they was all in the Library of Congress database. So an aide to the ambassador looked it up and there was Marilyn Monroe on the database. I had completely forgotten that I had sent all the pictures to Look Magazine to get another story published on the 10th anniversary of her death. And then they had donated. Well, the ambassador wrote the right letter to the right person and I got everything back, everything back. I did not remember the incident at the doorway when she says, go over there and you'll get a better shot. 
but it's all in the contact sheets. And you look in the Toshin book, you'll see the contact sheet, you'll see all the pictures I shot from the doorway, and you'll see the one frame amidst all the pictures that followed. And looking at that contact sheet triggered my memory. Now, there are times that I have extrapolated an emotion I remembered and tried to put it in words. And I'm going to give you an example. When I said to Marilyn, you know, you're already famous, you're going to make me famous. I honestly don't remember Marilyn saying, don't be so cocky. But I remember very well the way she looked at me. And it was, that message was saying, don't be so cocky, Larry. I remember her saying, photographers like you can easily be replaced. So I took that emotion that I remember and I put it into a line of dialogue. And I've done that several places in writing a memoir. And that's why it's called, you know, a photographer's memories, because it is my memories. Now, uh, Norman Mailer, when he wrote the Executioner's Song, which I contributed to, in some instances did the same thing. We would interview people together and separately. Sometimes we didn't have a tape recorder. We would remember an emotion, a feeling, and we would extrapolate that into one or two words of dialogue. Yes, the gentleman in the back with the camera. Hi, Larry. Um, uh, just what, I'm curious about your how you first started with your photographic career, the things that's got you interested, and you know the things you did to get these great assignments. When I was 12 years old, I was bar mitzvah, uh, like all Jewish boys are supposed to be. And my father gave me an East German camera called an Exacta. And I started taking pictures of a little glass Bambi that I had with a mirror under it. And I put water on it. And I would photograph the reflection of Bambi in the, the, the mirror with the water on it. And it looked like a real you know, animal. It didn't look like a plastic. So I started experimenting. But my father and mother, we lived in a small house. It was just after World War II when I was bar mitzvah. And uh, we didn't have a lot of money. And so I came up with this idea of listening to the radio. And you could get the police band on the end of the radio in those days. They didn't have separate bands. And there was an automobile accident. And I thought, oh, I could drive to the automobile accident with my camera on my bicycle. And I'll sell the picture to the newspaper. <laughs> well. Very quickly, I learned I always got to the accidents after it was all over. The cars had been towed away. You know, the police were gone, and all there was was a skid mark left. And what I learned the most was about light. Backlighting tells you one story with a skid mark. Side lighting tells you another. Flat overhead lighting on a dull day tells you another story. I learned more about lighting from skid marks. Now, I did start to sell the pictures to insurance companies because somebody once told me skid marks tell a story. I didn't understand about science in those days, but I did. And by the time I was 15 and a half years old, three years later, I had enough money to buy my first car, which was a Ford, a little two-door Ford. Yes, ma'am? Uh, what pictures, what kind of pictures didn't she like? Did she ever... Is she... In the, in the large Toshin book, which, you know, you can thumb through, there's a display copy on this side here, so it's done. You'll see some pictures that she edited. She didn't like pictures that showed muscles in her legs. She didn't mind uh, looking a little overweight. There's even an incredible picture that she approved in which, uh, uh, from her miscarriages, her uh, stomach, she hadn't had tummy tucks in those days, so she's got extra stomach flesh there. And she didn't mind those being published. I mean, quite honestly, she really giggled and liked it and said, you know, that's the real me. Uh, yet there was a time and a place. Uh, she never asked for her face to be retouched in a picture. I've spoken to like 30 photographers that photographed Marilyn when we did the book in 1972 with Norman. She never, never asked for her face to be retouched or her skin or anything. She either liked the picture or she didn't. And we all agree she was a damn good editor. Uh, very few pictures. Now, Bert Stern, who was a very, very fine photographer, 
he was smarter than me because he kept all the pictures that she X'd out. And, uh, she didn't use painting shears on him, she used them on me. But the short and long of it is, uh, if you really look at Bert's pictures, which are X'd out, uh, they're not as good as the ones she left. They're only good because it shows, you know, what she liked and didn't like in photography. Yes? Well, there's this cover of this book. This is the one when she turned over her shoulder. And this is the one frame that's on the roll of film in the middle of a lot of pictures that nobody would ever approve. Very simple black and white picture taken in 1960, but it really is my first real close-up picture of Marilyn, and it's a very, very simple image. And by the way, this is one of the pictures that was in the Library of Congress that I hadn't seen for 40 some odd years. Just amazing. I didn't even remember it. I didn't remember the incident until I looked at the contact sheet. And you see a picture of me and Johnny Cook and this and that, and then you see me, the pictures of me from the door, so the whole story came right back to me. Yes, ma'am. Is there a, like one favorite picture that you have of her? Is that written by emotions or by reasons? Well, I have five children and five grandchildren, and there isn't one child or grandchild that I like better than the other. So I, I would say I could limit it down to five pictures that I like. My daughter likes the one that uh, uh, says everything and shows nothing. Uh, uh, quite honestly, and I don't mean this rudely, I, there are so many photographs I've taken in the 15 years I was a photographer that I, there isn't. I mean, look, I have a great image of Lee Harvey Oswald. You know, I have the only picture of people just before they were executed. Uh, but there is no one picture that stands out. You know, I was tragically at many historic events that had negative connotations to them. Uh, you know, you parachuted in on stories. You did 100 assignments a year. You have to remember that the glossy magazines of those days were the educators of the world. When Life magazine ran uh, Leo Mason's pictures taken inside the womb of a woman as a baby is you know, uh, being developed during pregnancy. I mean, that was just shocking, I mean, to the world. Uh, and, you know, Life Magazine and National Geographic, they taught us what we needed to know. Television soon took over in the 70s. And now they're the educators of the world. I'm not saying they're giving us a better education or not. I'm not commenting as a sociologist in that way. But no, there isn't a picture that I have that's better. There are pictures that I see now that were going through my archives I don't even remember taking. 16 rolls of Konrad Adenauer, the Chancellor of Germany after the Second World War. And it took us months and months and months to figure out where and when I took the pictures. And only by going through another file on another subject and coming across expense account reports did I see Waldorf Astoria, uh, Konrad Adenauer, lunch. I bought myself lunch, and I realized I'm photographing the, in the Waldorf Astoria. I mean, I, sadly, a lot of the things I don't, you know, as you get older, I guess it's natural, you know. Well, I have a story about that. Well, I, uh, the Saturday Evening Post hired me in 1973 with five other photographers to try to rejuvenate the magazine. And there was a great editor by the name of Otto Friedrich who wrote children's books at that time. Very, very well known. And I was uh, sent to photograph the beaches of Normandy, where the Allied troops had landed on the French soil. Uh, and uh, you know, I went and I photographed them at night under moody conditions, under rain. I you know spent like a month there photographing. You know, how could I come up with something a little different? You know. And when I came back, I laid out the pictures for the picture editor, Hank Walker, and he called in, he loved him, called in Otto Friedrich, and Otto looked at him and all said, you know, what's this all about? And he said, what do you mean? He says, you know, you're just throwing a lot of pictures down. You know, you think I accept a writer coming in and just throwing words around? They've got to be organized, it's got to mean something, you know? So he was cracking this joke, you know, that, uh, you know, I better deliver him a story uh, rather than just a lot of pictures. So. You know, writing for me is a great challenge. You know, I, I, I didn't read this as well as maybe I have in the past, but 
To me, I, I want it to be my voice. And I want the warts of my, on my face to show. I want to show the imperfections in my own development and the mistakes that I made and the enemies that I crossed with. Uh, because if I'm more honest about myself, then what I write about has a greater ring of truth. I mean, in my autobiography, you'll, you'll read that twice in my life, I was involved in trading spies, involved in trading an East German for a Russian, and recently when Obama was trading spies, I knew one of the, the spies that was in jail that was brought back from 20 years earlier, and his wife, I mean, he insisted that I go to Russia and bring his wife and children out, that she wouldn't go out with anybody else because it wasn't that he trusted me, I guess he was gambling with me. So the short and long of it is my whole life experiences are very interesting and you, you have to be really honest. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, I pushed Marilyn too far about Playboy. You know, do I feel guilt that maybe part of the tragedy is on my shoulder? No, I don't. Uh, she was fighting too many demons. You know, she escaped into the darkness of night, as I write in here, the safe haven that so many celebrities themselves need. Tragically, the harbor she went into one night, she didn't come out of. Yes? I have to disagree with your characterization of your reading style, because it's actually very conversational. And, well, thank you, uh, thank you. You know, it's pre I much prefer it to people who start reading in that stilted tone. You know, right. which is so different you. from their natural voice. But, right. but I, was, I was wondering about one thing, which has perplexed me for a while, which is why was the studio, 20, 20th Century Fox, so upset that Marilyn went to sing at President Kennedy's birthday when that was the best publicity they could have dreamed of? You couldn't well, buy that. In, in, to a layman, you're 100% right. To somebody who runs a business, you're a million percent wrong. And let me explain why. And you have to remember, I became a motion picture director and a producer. I've won Emmys and, and an Oscar and so forth. Motion pictures are made up of pennies being spent and pennies being saved. If a movie is shot for 40 days and you lose a half hour a day, you times that times 40 days, and you've lost a lot of days of shooting. That's called running behind schedule. And each of those days add up to money, 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 money. Marilyn was always late on the set. She'd sit in her dressing room for hours trying to submerge herself into the myth or the character. She was a method actress. She had her own insecurities, the makeup, her face. You know, I don't think she ever drank. She wasn't an alcoholic, but she took pills. Uh, so there wasn't a day on the set that Marilyn Monroe didn't keep everybody waiting. That was money. And when you go past eight to 10 hours on a movie set, you go into what is known as golden time. That's not just double time, that's triple time. And when you got 111 members on a crew, makeup, hair, stylists, all under union contracts, you're talking about big money. Now, big money in those days was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Today's they're millions of dollars. Okay. Marilyn Monroe was on a budget of around three million, if I remember. They were $400,000 behind schedule. It was mathematics. They had approved her to go sing Happy Birthday to the President before they started, because that was something that was planned way on. But when they were running so far behind, there was no way they were gonna let her leave for three days, the jeopardy, the insurance, what would happen if she got a cold, the air conditioning on the airplane. And in fact, one night during the movie, she goes to the Dodgers baseball game and comes back with a cold and she can't show up to work the next day. So they were livid because she was doing what she wanted to do irrespective of the business losing money. Now, if you're her confidant, you sympathize with her. If you're the producer or the director, you know, you want to get this product done. It's a product. I learned that myself. When I started directing and producing films, I thought it was all art. And maybe when I was young and naive, I made my best films because I looked at it as art. 
My last three, fil three films were not very good, but they were on budget and lots of money was being made because I learned how myself to keep on schedule. And I had some problems with Farrah Fawcett. I had some problems with William Hurt and uh, uh, several other actresses. And I have to tell you, I worked on Barbara Streisand's movie and I didn't understand what Howard Koch would do. Barbara was supposed to be to the set by 9.30 on, uh, on a clear day, we, you know. And he had people all along Sunset Boulevard that were calling in on telephones right after her car would pass. She's this close, this, and he would keep the crews it would be the call sheet would be 9 o'clock. He knew Barbara wasn't going to be ready until 10.30, but he really, that was a phony call sheet to get her to leave the house at night. The real call sheet didn't have anybody coming until 10.30. That was Howard Koch Sr. Because that money made a difference, you see. How drastic of a difference in your physical appearance was there between a real self every day and the movies or the photography? It's always like a puzzle. It's a puzzle even to photographers. Uh, I think what's interesting about Something's Got to Give is she goes back and visually in the movie and in the photographs, she's very, very childish and very... You, you don't think this woman's been drunk, run over by trucks in her life, that she's had all these tragedies. She looks clean of that. That's why I say it like the morning dew. She was fresh. Uh, she knew how to do makeup. She had one makeup man for 40 years of her life. No, not 40, excuse me, 30 years of her life since she was a young girl, Whitey Snyder. Uh, she was a perfectionist. She could make herself look any way she wanted. Uh, the real Marilyn, uh, there's actually a very interesting small little picture in People Magazine this week of Frank Sinatra, Peter Lawford, Marilyn, and I think Rita Hayward or somebody, just looking, at, they're around the table in Frank Sinatra's house. And you would never know that's Marilyn Monroe standing there. Yeah, but you saw her in real life, in flesh and blood. That's, that's right, life. yeah. So you saw her walking in, how could you say, wow, she's a really beautiful woman. Now. From the rear end, you would know it's Marilyn Monroe, no, no, the way no, she no, walked. Her face. <laughs> no, you wouldn't know it. The, the Marilyn Monroe that I saw on many occasions, she could walk and she'd be sitting there, you wouldn't know it. I will tell you one thing, which is in the, my full autobiography, is she, she took an eighth of an inch off her right heel on all her high heels, and that helped her with that little walk. I mean, she was really a perfectionist. Now, whether somebody told her to do that or whatever, but, you know, an eighth of an inch off the right heel. So would you consider her a great beauty? Or? No, Michelle Morgan is a great beauty. What do you mean? Catherine Deneuve is a great beauty. Marilyn Monroe is lovable, huggable, and fuckable. <laughs> in some ways, yes. Are you French? Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, now I understand, and, and you're not far off. Uh, uh, you know, you and Yves Montan would think the same way. Uh, but very, very seriously, uh, she is a chameleon in many ways. She can change the way she wants to look and be, and, uh, you know, tragically. Look, you know, I didn't read the section, but there's a section in which I'm talking to her about how excited that we are, uh, Judy and I, that we're gonna have our second child and everything else, and all of a sudden she talks to me, and I, and I write very clearly, I don't remember all of the words, I actually say that in the book, but this is what I think she was saying to me, is that she wanted to have a child very, very badly, but at the same time, she understood that her mother was in mental hospitals, that her father had attempted suicide, she was scared shitless. They beeped the word shitless when I told that story on NPR radio yesterday. Uh, she was scared shitless that the genes would be passed down and that a child might have insanity in its blood. And that's why she told me that she felt her body rejected the child even though her desire was to have a child. There's also a passage there about Robert well, yeah, my, my Kennedy stories. I, I saw her with Bobby Kennedy at her house. I did see her in her house. Yes, in the backyard of the swimming pool. I did not see them in the bedroom together. No, 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 but, but, but there's a lot more to the story, which is not here, which is in the autobiography. And that is that Ed Guthman, who was Bobby's aide and adjusted partner, and I became very good friends. And when he was the editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the LA Times, he and I built a very strong relationship years later. In fact, 
Bobby Kennedy hired me to be his photographer, one of the three photographers on the 68 campaign. And I did his last billboard, which was in California when he was assassinated. Uh, so many, many times, uh, you know, uh, I was with Bobby. I'm not saying we spoke about Marilyn Monroe, don't get me wrong. But after Ed Guthman retired and started teaching at the university in LA, I went and interviewed Ed for my archives. And I said, what do you want me to say about uh, Bobby and Marilyn? He says, well, just tell the truth that I drove Bobby out there all the time. And I had that right on a tape recorder, you see. So, uh, uh, you know, I don't quote any of Bobby's dialogue because I don't remember a word of it, you see. I just know that she jumped in the swimming pool right. with a bathing suit on. And, you know, and I guess I fantasized would she come out without, but no, it wasn't going to happen. Just a childhood fantasy, a young lady then. She had a big curiosity about politics. She was very well read. She had read uh, Carl Sandburg's Lincoln, and eventually she built a relationship with him, meeting him on several occasions, once with uh, Arthur Miller, and then when Carl Sandburg was writing for George, Se George Stevens Sr., uh, Diary of Anne Frank, she met him again, and near the end of her life, uh, she built a paternal relationship with Sandburg. She was very, very well read. Uh, she had a lot of time on her hands in between movies. Uh, I don't think she had, from what I understand, I mean, I was very close to Ernie Kovacs, and, you know, Dean Martin would always come over and play poker, and we'd talk a little bit about Marilyn, you know, after her death. Uh, you know, they took her more seriously than the studios did. And not because of her beauty, I think because she was witty, she was smart. And uh, I remember once in Lawford's house, she was in the corner talking to either uh, Schlesinger or uh, Teddy White, I don't remember which, about Cuba. And uh, uh, I don't remember the conversation. All I remember is she wasn't asking questions, she was making statements. I don't remember really what she said. But what I do remember, it wasn't like she was asking questions. The young lady here, yes. Uh, well, I have two questions. What's your impression on how she was versus how the public viewed her? And do you think she really committed suicide or she was? Well, the first thing is, I think she was a fine actress. And what you saw on the screen was her skill as an actress. Now, I think she developed that with the photographer Andre Didienis in the early 50s. Andre was a Hungarian and a dramatist, uh, and uh, uh, she, she learned a lot uh, with Andre. Look, I don't know what happened that night. It would be wrong for me to speculate, especially with the type of books I do in which I don't speculate. Uh, you know, there are lots of different stories who she spoke to that night. Uh, I know when Norman was writing the biography, you know, at one point DiMaggio was going to be interviewed, but Norman felt he didn't want to interview DiMaggio. Uh, I do know from Joe DiMaggio Jr.'s wife, who I've had several conversations with, that Joe DiMaggio Jr. did speak to her that night about 11.30 at night, because she was having problems with her future husband and he was calling and asking her for advice. And the irony was that she later, the wife, Joe DiMaggio Jr.'s wife and I become friends on another matter. Thank you everybody for coming. And uh, you know, it's an interesting experience for me. Uh, I have one more of these talks uh, to do uh, in uh, Sag Harbor about Maryland and then I'm gonna go on and have other experiences. Thank you so much for coming. If anybody got any books you want me to sign, uh, uh, I'll be more than glad to. Thank you.